Okay, so we are finishing up our questions from chapter 10, dealing with the concept of salvation and the exclusive, uh, the exclusive nature of salvation coming from the gospel. Uh, we already answered uh, one and two, how do the biblical claims about Christ and salvation indicate exclusivism, and why do you think that saying there is only one way to heaven is so offensive in our world today? Uh, and we talked about the fact that certainly there are other, uh, other religions that do not focus on Jesus that claim to be followers of God or Jehovah. There are some religions that don't even claim to be followers of God or Jehovah, but they do believe in a afterlife or some other form of salvation, and yet none of those offer the salvation that God and Christ Jesus offer. And that even so-called Christian churches, uh, all many of them teach different means of obtaining salvation. And when referring to other religions, some think that those are perfectly fine too. As if it doesn't really matter what you believe, as long as it makes you a better person, as Doi pointed out in the chapter, uh, that that's really kind of the point. Which leads us to question three. Why is just focusing on the ethics of Christian behavior not going to be very convincing when arguing for salvation only in Christ? Why is it that focusing only on the ethics or morality of Christian behavior, trying to use that to prove salvation is only in Jesus, why is that going to be difficult? If you limit one thing, then you open the door and limit all sorts of stuff. Okay. Okay, I'll give an example. Well, only salvation in Christ instead of only salvation in Buddha or something else like that. Well, if you start putting limits on stuff, then then you your your ethics are limiting things and you're you're funneling down to a central point. Okay. So what you go ahead. I wasn't here last week, so I'm not sure what you covered, but you know, focusing on just ethics, you know, you know, if we just practice, you know, it doesn't matter what you do as long as you practice something. Right. Well, if you say only Christ, well, you've started a limitation that has to keep going, you know. <clears throat> right. You, you, they, they contradict each other. Right. I mean, and as Doy pointed out, and as we took, looked at last week, just the fact that Jesus says, he who believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That in and of itself is exclusive and limiting, which means that, that people who do not believe will be condemned. That's exclusive. Yeah, Philip. You also have to take into account the fact that our society for centuries has been based around uh, the morality taught in the Bible. Yeah. And a lot of people who live in the society who take benefit of those things and of the way things are structured, they don't realize that or they, they take that for granted. So a lot of times appealing to the morality and the ethics taught by Jesus it, it sort of seems second nature to a lot of people. They don't realize where it comes from. They don't realize that many societies in the past and even societies today in lots of different places in the world don't live by those things. Right. And had they, and if you transplant them there, they're going to be completely and totally uh, shocked. And so they, they do not see the disconnect between uh, where it comes from and, and the point where it comes from Jesus because Right. Right. You know, it, it's interesting, of course, you know, as Doi talks about the ethics that is associated with religious thought or spirituality, a lot of times morality can be, generally speaking, again, that's a very broad phrase that is up for, uh, people don't really like to specifically define morality, and of course, we know that God has defined right and wrong, the standard of right and wrong, uh, but when it comes to ethics itself, there's a lot of religions whose followers practice a moral code. Okay? Uh, there's a lot of individuals who claim to have uh, scriptures given to them by their God or by their prophet or, or uh, ancient writings that they use as a guideline that provide some sort of a standard. And as long as it makes you a better person, again, by this, defined by this broad sense of ethics or this broad standard of morality, then what difference does it make what the specifics are of how you worship or who you worship? 
What well, really does that make, uh, difference does that make in, in the grand scheme of things? And that's kind of what Doy's point is all about, is that when you begin to focus on the specifics, as Dwayne mentioned, you have specific behavior. You have specific things you are not supposed to do because those things are considered sinful. You have specific ways you are to worship. And when you start entering into that realm, that's when people start to kind of buck the trend, so to speak. They don't want to get that specific. They want the general feel of, I'm a better person, uh, my family's a better you know, family, we're more well-rounded because of this. Let's not confuse it with specifics. And so arguing for salvation only in Christ only goes so far when you just look at behavior. And then, of course, you have to add in the fact, well, what about hypocrisy? And that can open up a whole different can of worms, especially if people have had a bad experience with so-called Christians who didn't actually practice what they preached. So that opens up a whole different aspect of it. Any other thoughts through that one? Next question, why do you think we should be emphasizing to people lost in sin, or what do you think we should be emphasizing to people lost in sin, and why? What do you think we should emphasize to individuals who are in a lost state, and why should we be emphasizing that? Let me ask you this question. To somebody that you know isn't interested in really religion, doesn't have any background in religion, and they are involved in a lot of things that are wrong, but you walk up to them and start talking to them about profanity and start trying to explain why profanity is sinful in the scriptures. While true, okay, while certainly we should not be involved in profanity, do you think that's going to be the best way to go about trying to show somebody that they need to make changes in their life. Why not? Okay, so there's a, there's a common phrase among preachers, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Okay, there's that aspect of it. Knowing that you aren't just being judgmental, as a phrase is often used, but that you care about a person's soul. But if that's the case, why would you focus just on profanity, for instance? Is profanity their problem? What's their problem? Ignorance. The lack of understanding of God's word, right? That's the problem. The problem is sin. That is the very thing that Doi is dealing with in this chapter, is that man's problem is sin. And to address that sin, Christ has, has come in to the world. He was uh, lived a perfect life. He was uh, killed for us. He was sacrificed for us. He was raised from the dead. And now we have opportunity for forgiveness of sin. A person's only issue isn't going to be just one particular sin or failing in their life. It's an issue of mind and heart, understanding and accepting the truth of God's word, and then taking God's word and making changes, not just one change, but changes in their life. And so the, 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 when talking to an individual, what should we emphasize then? If it's not necessarily pointing out this sin or that sin in their life, what might be the better route to take? Okay, uh, yeah, starting, starting on where our common ground would be, do you believe in, in God? In fact, that's what the next chapter is going to be about, chapter 11, about approaches to talking about the existence of God. Uh, do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe that Jesus died for you? Do, you do, do they have an awareness of what sin is? Do they recognize a need that they have to be forgiven of sin? And then going, starting from that point... And then talk about the importance of learning God's word. Talk about the importance of why Christ died for us. Is that sugarcoating the gospel simply because you start at the beginning? Are you sugarcoating the gospel? Are you implying that that person is okay with whatever sin is in their life? No. But I've heard that argued before. Well, you have to point out sins in a person's life, uh, and you have to you know, go verse by verse and show why they're wrong. Otherwise, you're not teaching the truth. It, it, it's not a matter of saying, well, it's okay to, to 
say use profanity and it's okay to steal and it's okay to lie. That's not, that's not the point. The point is that in the process of a person learning what sin is, in the process of learning why they should be concerned about their sin, as they learn the truth, what's going to happen automatically? They're going to learn. And if they don't, certainly we can point it out. But they're going to learn as they have come to accept the word of God, what does God's word say about stealing? What does God's word say about lying or about uh, fornication or adultery or profanity or whatever else it may be? God's word's going to reveal that. But it's not going to matter to somebody if they haven't first asked that question, why should I care about sin? What does it matter? And so you have to start somewhere. And starting at the very beginning and working your way forward then leads it to be about what God's word says, not about some person pointing fingers at areas of your life saying, you're not doing that right, you're not doing that right, you're not doing that right, which may be true from God's word, but we have to focus on the soul and on their state. Yes, sir. Right. Right. And if you're lacking in that foundation, once you get to the more advanced stuff, you're going to be lost. Okay, I can speak from experience with my experiences in algebra. Okay, at some point I must have missed something because all of a sudden they started throwing letters in with numbers and I'm like, what in the world is this? I could not grasp, it took me a while to grasp the concept of algebra. And I must have missed something somewhere, that, that kind of that, that uh, uh, transitioning over to algebra, because I didn't have a, a foundation to understand what in the world they were doing. And the same is true in, in Acts 17 with Paul at Mars Hill. If Paul had started off speaking to the Athenians about prophecy and Old Testament and then jumping into Christ being raised from the dead, do you think he would have had the reaction that he actually had? Why should the Athenians care about Jewish, Jewish law? Why should the Athenians care about Jewish prophecies? Did Paul start with Jewish prophecies and law? What did he start with? <coughs> he started with the unknown God. He even quoted, he even quoted some of their own, uh, well, what, they, what they themselves talked about in terms of God. In him we live, we move, and have our, uh, have our being. And so from that perspective, the understanding of starting where a person is, building up then that foundation, helping a person come along to then, like Nathan. Did Nathan, when Nathan approached David, did Nathan immediately say, David, you've sinned, you sinned with Bathsheba, then you sinned in killing Uriah? Did, did, did Nathan start out with that? In fact, one would argue, could argue that the strongest case that can be made to somebody is the, the case they make themselves. What did David ultimately come to when Nathan said, thou art the man? Well, he said, what do you think should happen to this person in this scenario? David says, that person should be killed. He should pay back what he took. And then Nathan says, thou art the man. And what happened to David? He realized, I have sinned. I have sinned before. Nathan had to get his mind and his heart ready to hear what he needed to hear. And that really is the case with people that we talk to. They need to understand why they should care. Sometimes that takes time to build that up into that component of why they should care. But that's what we need to emphasize is that people, Jesus died because people need an answer to sin. And so starting from there, we can then help them address their state before God if they're willing to listen. Thoughts or comments with that one? All right, last question. What reasons are there for saying that Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation? Can you think of others not listed? Yeah, you go through all of these different uh, points that Doi makes regarding why salvation only in Jesus. Well, Jesus is the only one who has sacrificed himself for us. 
Okay, no other person, and in all of these points that he makes, because Christ is the one who came into this world, God in the flesh, and he died for the sins of the world. No one else has claimed to do that. No one else has taken on that mantle to, to, to provide those, that means of sacrifice for us. Because Christ is the only one who can properly mediate between God and man. Christ is the only one who ever lives to make intercession for us. Christ is the only one who backed up his remarkable claims with the things that he did, particularly the miracles and ultimately the resurrection from the dead. Uh, because Christ is the only one who was raised from the dead, never to die again, and in fulfillment of his own claims and prophecies. And because Christ is the ultimate judge, and we will all stand before him. These are all... These are all reasons for saying that Christ is the only way to salvation. Jesus himself claimed to be the only way to salvation. By its very nature, that is exclusive and very conditional. While God so loved the world unconditionally, is God's grace therefore unconditional? While God's love is unconditional, and I don't think anybody would argue that, is God's grace unconditional? That is his favor. Grace teaches us, Titus chapter 2, that we should deny what? Deny godliness, worldly lusts. Okay? We should live righteously, soberly, and godly in the present age. That's what grace itself teaches. That is exclusive. That is, is a standard that must be met in order for grace, God's grace or his uh, favor, to be bestowed. Now, we do those things through what? Through faith. Okay, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. But Abraham submitted to God to obey through faith. That's very exclusive. Can you think of any others not listed? <coughs> Anything else that you caught that maybe Doy didn't? I, I figured he covered it pretty well. All right. Anything else through that one? Okay. Let's move on to chapter 11. Chapter 11 is all about uh, kind of going to the basics of reasons to believe in God. The very first part of this section, uh, before he starts getting into the specific reasons, and that's really how the chapter's broken down, are here are the different arguments for trying to convince somebody that there is a God, that God exists. To start out with, uh, Doi wants to address the question, first of all, how do I show that there is a God? But then he offer, wants to offer a couple of caveats as well in offering these arguments to people. So in preparing to address the existence of God, most atheists and agnostics will, will challenge you to prove that God exists. At some point in time, most of us, if not already, will encounter somebody to try to get us to make the case to prove that God is real. What they're generally challenging us to provide is scientific demonstration proving the existence of God. Generally speaking, they know full well that can you prove God through scientific demonstration? Can you prove that? Can you take a microscope and, and see God? No. Can you disprove God through a scientific demonstration? Okay, it goes both ways. You can't prove or disprove scientifically the existence of God. What are willing, people willing to accept? He brings up those uh, presuppositions uh, again, those biases again. Are people willing to entertain the possibility that something beyond the material world exists, the spiritual realm? Most naturalists, and he'll talk about that in just a minute, most, na most naturalists, they believe that the material realm is all there is. So everything that is must be explained through material means. If they refuse to admit that something outside of the material world can be real, then they will not accept evidence for God, no matter how powerful. 
Sometimes people are just looking to pick a fight or, or they're trying to be heavy handed in their, their leading questions and so forth. They're, they're trying to make you doubt yourself. And some people can be really good at it because they don't want to address the issue on, a, on an actual uh, good faith basis. They don't aren't interested in looking at their actual lives. They're more interested in trying to get you to chase your tail. But we have to be able to rise above some of those efforts and try to get a person to actually think about, so if you die, you cease to exist and there's nothing else? Now, some people actually want to believe that. But generally speaking, the majority of people, the majority of people in our world believe in some form of an afterlife. Some form of existence after death. And even atheists and agnostics will have to admit that, well, why is it that so many people in an enlightened world still believe in an afterlife of some kind? Well, there has to be a reason for that. The primary historical argument for God's existence is the resurrection of Jesus, which is verified through eyewitness testimony and historical documentation. This is something Doe's already covered, dealing with the writing of Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. He focuses on that specifically because that's an early date uh, writing. I mean, written maybe 10 to 15 years after the events of the resurrection of Jesus. And even... Uh, historical scholars have to acknowledge and admit that this is written within the time frame specified this is acknowledged as being uh, written by Paul the Apostle that being the case it was completely against Paul the Apostle's best interest to make the case that he makes it was against his best interest to turn become a Christian to start with so uh, there are a few other legitimate avenues of argumentation. However, we must preface the, these with the following caveats. All right, anything so far through this, uh, the points that, that Doi's making? All right, so here's the caveats that he wants to include in talking about these different uh, avenues of argumentation. All of the following arguments share the same basic weakness. They can take should be one. They can take one in the direction of believing in God, serving as a foot in the door, so to speak, opener, but they cannot prove the God of the Bible or Jesus as the Son of God. Because ultimately, what's the evidence for the God of the Bible and Jesus as the Son of God? It's the Bible, right? It's the, the historical evidence of specifically the resurrection of Jesus. Okay, everything, the, the primary, all focuses around the resurrection of Jesus. But that is the only way. That's how we know about Jesus. That's how we know about God. These cannot provide the kind of scientific proof some are seeking. God cannot be put in a test tube and observed. If that is what some are seeking, to, if that is what some are seeking in order to be convinced, then they will likely remain unconvinced. However... For those with an open mind, these arguments will have merit. And again, that goes back to those presuppositions. If I'm talking to somebody who fervently believes that the material world is all there is, then these may not have as big of an impact. However, as Doi points out at the, towards the end of the chapter, one of the most famous atheist philosophers of the 20th century, his name was Antony Flew, he actually changed his mind he stopped being an atheist and became a theist, not necessarily a believer in Jehovah, God of the Bible, but a believer of a God or intelligent mind that created all things because of these types of arguments. So they can help, or at least they can open that door to helping somebody to consider some of the, the broader aspects that they would have to answer if they continue to believe that there isn't a God. Now, we know an atheist is someone who doesn't believe in, in, in God. What does agnostic mean? What does it mean to be agnostic? Does anybody know what gnosis, the Greek term gnosis, means in the New Testament? Knowledge. Yeah. So if I'm agnosis or agnostic... What does that mean? Can't be sure. 
Okay, someone who either claims, who, who, who believes or claims to believe that they aren't really sure if there's a God. Some people are agnostic atheists. They're not really sure there's not a God, but they tend to believe that there's not one. Some are agnostic theists. They can't be really sure there is a God, but they tend to think that there might be. But either way, agnostics are ones that kind of sit in the middle. They don't want to really commit one way or the other. They're, just, they're not convinced that there is or isn't fully. Any thoughts or comments through what Doi's caveats are in dealing with these arguments? All right. So the first one is the cosmological argument. Uh, and he quotes Psalm 19, verse 1, in uh, kind of the, the opening of this discussion. The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. And it's really neat when you start looking at, there are several YouTube videos that attempt to show the scale of the universe. So when we say universe, we don't just mean the galaxy of the Milky Way. Okay, even the galaxy of the Milky Way is in a galactic cluster. Okay, we're close to other galaxies like Andromeda and so forth. And then there are multiple galaxy clusters in a certain part of the observable universe, and then it expands out and shows you another part or fraction of the observable universe, then it expands out even further to the point where once you get to where you're seeing the scale of the full observable universe, again, observable being as far as we can see, not necessarily meaning as far as what is, the scale is completely, uh, it's, it, you can't comprehend the amount of space and mass and distance that we're talking about. It is just unfathomable by anything that you and I have experienced. So it kind of puts it into perspective what David observes about the heavens telling of the glory of God and the expanse of creation declaring the work of his hands, the power and the majesty involved it, that it took to create such a universe. This argument is basic cause and effect reasoning. If there is an effect, there must have been something that caused the effect. When applied to the universe, the question is asked, why is there something rather than nothing? What caused the universe to exist? Is the universe eternal? The argument of everything that exists has a cause for or of its existence, while simple to state, subjects one to the question of God's origin. And this is a kind of a, a drawn-out explanation by, I say drawn-out, it was, it was good explanation by Doi. It was just hard for me to, to condense into a one-line point. But what, what his point was is that the, the argument of the cosmological concept of the cause and effect thought, it's good, it's a good argument to the point of if you say it blanketly as everything that exists must have a cause for its existence. Well, God exists. What's the cause of God's existence? And obviously God wouldn't count in that. Therefore, the better argument is the Callum argument. And he referenced the term Callum, which means uh, uh, talking. The term means talking. The Callum argument focuses on material objects. This argument is not that everything has a cause, but that every contingent entity or object must have a cause. So anything contingent, that which is to say, relied on something else for its beginning, relied on something else for its creation, must have had a cause for it to be created. And I think that's a very important differentiation, very important specification to make. As Doi points out here, if something can be shown to have a beginning, then what caused it to begin? God cannot, by definition, fall into this category, because did God have a beginning? No. God says, I am that I am. What does that mean, I am that I am? Literally, it means I who exist, exist. Seems rather redundant, don't you think? Why does God say that to Moses through the burning bush? Uh, 
I who exist, exist. What does that mean? Does God rely on anyone else for his continued existence? Did he rely on anyone to create him to start with? He has always been. And this kind of leads into the lack of comprehension once again. Just as scale of the cosmos is beyond our comprehension, the idea of infinite, the idea of eternal, without beginning and without end, it, it, it kind of gives you a nosebleed when you start to think about it. Because God didn't start. He has always been. Well, then how long was it before he created the universe? There is no such thing as a how long was it before he created the universe. There was no sense of time. He created time. He, cre he created time. Okay, he created the, the morning and the day, or it was the, the, the night and the day. In the, the first In the beginning, the first night and the first day. That was the first day. Okay, he created the concept of time. So the things that are, the things that exist, or specifically God, I who exist, exist. He relies on no one. He is, is self-sufficient. He is complete, uh, completely autonomous to any other uh, need or anything else in creation. He is the one that created all things and therefore cannot be subject to this concept of being contingent. That being the case... Is there evidence that the universe had a beginning? Now, most of us will immediately think of the Big Bang Theory. The idea that at one time everything was condensed in this tiny itty bitty little ball and that it exploded and in an instant of the fraction of a second, all of a sudden all the mass, all of the energy of our universe was then just kind of thrown out there. And it, ex it expanded so fast and so quickly to what we now see. That brings up an interesting issue though, doesn't it? What, what possible problem with that argument do you see simply from a logical perspective? Where did it come from? Where, where did that start? That little ball of mass, that little ball of energy had to come from somewhere you would think. Now there are some, and we're going to talk more about this when we get to intelligent design and so forth, but there are some I'll call them religious individuals, believers in a higher power or a God who think that that God created the little ball. And then he snapped his fingers, it went bang, and then evolution took over and the universe took over and now it's been billions of years in the making that we're here. God created the little ball and then let everything else take over. First of all, that's an effort to try to harmonize with scientific observation, try to, to harmonize belief in a God with the belief of the universe being billions of years old. But if you have a God who's able to create that little ball capable of creating a universe, what else could that God do? Couldn't he create a universe already billions of years old? Couldn't he create a universe that's already expanding? Couldn't he create a sun that's already a couple billion years old? Did he make Adam and Eve newborns? No. So it, it, it seems odd that you have some people who claim to be Christian or believers in God who make that type of an argument that there was a first cause, which is God, who created that little ball and then boom. It seems to be defeat the point. Well, that God could just as easily have spoken everything into existence as, he, as the Bible says he did. Why do you have to go through all these jumps and hoops? And it's an effort to try to, to harmonize and marry the scientific concepts with belief in God. But, logic. We're limiting God by man's logic. You're limiting, you're limiting God. What, God couldn't have created everything? He made that ball of infinite energy. Why couldn't he do everything else? But the second part of this is more and more even though it hasn't caught up to our kids' school books yet, the vast majority of scientists in the community dealing with astrophysics and so forth are beginning to reject the Big Bang Theory. There are too many holes and too many problems that it creates, 
And so many have rejected outright in papers and everything the concept of the Big Bang Theory. In fact, we even covered in one of our daily devotionals, it's been a couple months back, one of the scientists who actually wrote a book back in the 90s about the Big Bang Theory not being accurate and not explaining the, the types of, of issues that, that they're observing in the universe. Uh, he wrote back in the 90s that this isn't, this isn't right. This isn't, he's not a Christian. He's not a, he's not a religious person at all, as far as I know. He simply was saying it doesn't fit the, the science. Now, notice this is what, what Doi brings up about the evidence of the universe having a beginning. The universe is expanding, which implies a point in time when it must have begun. It all started from a certain point. Whenever God started, created everything, he created the heavens and the earth, he created the earth, he created all of that. He created that in existence. But now things are moving outward. Not that new things are being created. That's not what the, the point is. It's that things are now spreading out. They're in motion. Well, for things to have, be in motion, there had to be a point in time when they were set in motion. And that's what Doi's point is, is that if the universe is expanding, then there had to be a point at which it started. According to the second law of thermodynamics, processes that occur within a closed system tend, I got a lot of typos in this, tend toward a state of equilibrium or decay, which is to say, a closed system will not allow any, any introduction of new energy or new matter into the system. And that's what he's describing with the universe. The universe, if it's a closed system, meaning there's no source of new mass, there's no source of new energy, it's all starting off with the same energy it's always had, with no energy being fed into the system, everything would eventually burn out. Uh, you would think that over a period of time, if a, if a closed system starts to decay, eventually all the energy would run out. So why hasn't it? And that's the point that he's making. Why hasn't this happened if the universe did not have a beginning? If it has always been and it's eternal, where has all the energy gone? How is the energy being produced back into the system in order to maintain the equilibrium? Because we can observe energy being utilized. We can observe black holes sucking in mass and all of this, but we're not seeing new energy being put back in. We're not observing new mass being created. There's not continual creation happening. So where's it all going? And how is it being maintained? That's one of the points that he makes. Any thoughts to those first two? Yes, sir. So, by our understanding of physics, that should not happen. Shouldn't happen. If anything, it should slow down because eventually, you know, things should get in the way. But space itself, according to their observations, it seems to be expanding. Yeah. They don't have an explanation for that. They they want to point to things like dark matter, and dark energy, which is just something basically says we have no idea. It's a catch-all <laughs> phrase. Yeah. And so, keeping all of that in mind. People who take and say, I believe in science, this is the only thing that could possibly be. The scientists don't know. And the honest ones will tell you, I don't know. Yeah. They will tell you that, that they don't know because there's things they can't prove. Well, and even if they come up with a unifying theory, okay, a unifying theory that explains everything, can they prove it? The, 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 the interesting thing about the Big Bang Theory or uh, evolution as a theory. Can you observe that and test that? It's not even a theory as much as it is a, a uh, proposition. It's really more of a faith than it is anything else. You can have all kinds of theories that happen to fit the facts, but is that gonna work in a court of law? You have circumstantial evidence, which is a theory that fits perfectly everything that happened that points to this person as the murderer. But is that actually going to prove that this person committed the murder? 
That won't, that won't work in a court of law. You have to have evidence. And the thing about a theory is generally theories are considered as things that can then be taken and then proven or disproven in an in a, a experimental setting. Can you prove macroevolution? That one species can then turn into a different species? No. Because it hasn't happened in the, the experience of man's existence. Of course, the explanation for that is we're in a lull. We're in an evolutionary lull right now, which is why no species are currently switching over to a different species. That's the explanation for that. You can't prove the Big Bang. You can't prove any of this because the whole point of it is we're observing these things and we're going to fit it into a, a thought process of here's the explanation for it. And that explanation is all focused around the material world and has nothing to do with God. Because they can believe in these extraordinary dark energies and dark matter that they cannot see, they cannot test, they cannot observe or prove exists. But we can't believe in a God for whom we have eyewitness testimony of his existence. But we can't believe in God. Because you can't see him, you can't test him, you can't experiment with his characteristics or nature. It would seem that people in the scientific community are going a little bit even further into what many refer to as a blind faith. Blind faith is faith without any reason to believe so, believe that whatever it is. Is our faith blind? Our belief in God, our belief in Jesus, is it blind? Sometimes people say we blindly believe. Do we blindly believe? Do we have a reason to believe? We have the scriptures. That's what we have. And that's what we believe in. Uh, so the final point that he makes regarding the cosmological argument is, so if the evidence suggests that the universe had a beginning, is it not reasonable to believe that something greater than the material universe created it? I think it's perfectly reasonable to uh, accept that as a potential answer for anybody with an open mind. Rather than, no, that's not possible, let's come up with all these complex and, and uh, full of whole type of theories to accommodate all of this while not really coming to an ultimate answer regardless. Anything through that? All right, well, last one, we won't have time to really get into it, but the teleological argument. Teleology has to do with design and purpose. Various regularities, laws that we observe in the universe imply that there is some purpose or design in the way things work. If there is evidence of design, then reason suggests there is a designer. And this has been most popularized, most people who've kind of dealt with this concept. In 1802, William Paley, he wrote a book called Natural Theology in which he used the analogy dealing with the watch and a watchmaker. And he described it, Doy doesn't go into a whole lot of, of, of the details of the story, but, and it's taken on various revisions and so forth. But it kind of describes the concept of if an ancient human from, from thousands of years ago came across a pocket watch, okay, they pick it up and they look at it, what would their deduction be? Would they think that the earth has naturally created this pocket watch? Even though they know nothing about pocket watches, they know nothing about the intricacies of it or the complexities or how it works, what would the natural deduction be? Someone created it. Someone designed it. So someone, even with the, the example is a caveman who comes across a pocket watch, even that caveman would come to the conclusion that this is a tool created for a purpose because it has design which means somebody created it. All right, we'll stop there. We will pick up with this point and the rest of the teleological, tele, teleological argument next Sunday. Thank you, everybody.